Hello and welcome to Kelsey Ed, a place for making learning technology easy. In today's video, we'll be following on with barcodes, looking at them in real life scenarios, how they are used, why they're used, what their advantages are, and most importantly, how does that apply to examination questions? We will also look at some exam questions on the principles of operation, which is the content covered in the last video. If you haven't seen that one, please follow the link in the description. If you enjoy the content today, please like, subscribe, and of course, select notifications so you can be the first person to know when new content arrives. Hope you enjoy this and learn lots. Okay, so in the last video, we looked at the principles of operations for barcodes, which was how they actually work. Today, we want to look at the real life scenarios, and that's where they're used and why they're used, what the advantage is to the people that are using them. And at the end of the video, we'll look at some examination questions for both the principles of operation and the real life scenarios. But we have some exam tips, first of all. So as you're watching the video, I want you to think about these tips. And remember that you are always going to need to read the exam question very, very carefully and specifically look at what the scenario is because you need to reference back to that scenario. If it's an airport, you need to put it in terms of an airport passenger. If it's in a supermarket, it needs to be talking about either the customer or the owner of the business. And that's the way we're going to pick up marks. And not only that, it also needs to be in full sentences. And by referencing the scenario, you will automatically start to create full sentences because you'll explain this would be used in this way by this person because it benefits in this other way. So now there's two main advantages that you can use for absolutely any type of barcode. So if you're struggling to remember in a scenario, just think about these two advantages and see if you can relate it back to that scenario at all. So the first one would be that we make less mistakes when we use barcodes because it's automatically entering the data. There is no room for a human mistyping information like the price of a product. Next, it's much faster than manual input. Now it's important that you say what it is faster than. You can't just say that a barcode is faster or that it's quicker or that it saves time. You have to explain why. And it's specifically faster than a human input would be. You scan the barcode, it's boop, automatic, done. If you've got a type, it's, you know, so it's gonna be faster. So where do we use barcodes? Well, one of the main ones is in a supermarket or a store or what we call the point of sale, which can also be POS. And the point of sale is basically the checkout area at your supermarket. You also need to know some of the additional hardware that goes with it. Now, hardware is any electronic device that you can physically touch. It's hard, right? That's why it's hardware. So we're going to run through a couple of those hardware items and hopefully you're familiar with some of those. And this is how they would be used in a real life scenario. So that's its purpose in real life. First of all, we've got the barcode scanner, of course, that directly relates to the barcodes. And of course, that's used to scan the product's ID. We also have a printer. So when you do your shopping, you get a printout, you get a receipt. You need a printout for that itemized receipt. And uh, we should start to use the word itemized here because it also relates to one of the advantages of using barcodes, which is that the customer will receive an itemized receipt. Itemized means it lists every item that you bought. Touch screen. So this is an input and an output device, and that's going to be used for products that perhaps don't have a barcode on them. So if you think about when you buy fresh fruit, it doesn't come in a packet with a barcode. Um, you often have to weigh it yourself and then you select the type of vegetable that you want or the type of fruit that you want. It could also be used if um, the barcode's not working for some reason and you need to manually enter. Now, in addition to a touch screen, when it comes to manually entering, there's the keypad. In exam, it's really important that you say keypad and not keyboard. 
Uh, the keyboard is your full QWERTY, all of the necessary keys for using a computer. In this situation, you don't need to be able to type out all of the letters of the alphabet or use all of the functions of a keyboard. So instead, what we have is the keypad, which is specifically the numeric part. And that might be used if we have to key in uh, details of a product that didn't scan properly or again, something that doesn't have a barcode. Next is monitor. Now, the monitor is used to display the products that are being bought. So if you think about when you're at the checkout, again, at the point of sale, and every time something is scanned, you can look at it coming up on the screen. And uh, you might see your parents or even yourself might be looking and identifying what is being bought as it comes up in real time. Another item would be the speaker. So that's used to communicate information to the sales representative, to the member of staff, to the employee. So when you scan a product, if it scans correctly, bloop, you get a nice positive sound. But if it scans incorrectly, it's like, mm -mm, and it will give you some sort of error sound that you can quickly identify that didn't scan quickly and rescan the item. Now we also have methods of payment. Those are key input devices. And there's two of those that we would use. One of them is a chip and pin reader. So when you look at this card here, it has a chip. Now that chip is read using a chip and pin reader. So the machine will read the chip, retrieve the information from the bank, and then the cost of the sale is displayed here. The customer will enter their PIN, which would then be authorized by the bank and allow the transaction to take place. Earlier than chip and PIN machines was the magnetic stripe. Now you don't see these as often now, but they are still available and they're still on this syllabus. So the magnetic stripe is basically reading this part of a card. So on the back, there's a strip and you, you might yourself have a card that has this kind of strip on that's not even for uh, paying for something. Uh, you could, it could also be loyalty cards that were used with something like this. Stock control is basically referring to all of the merchandise and products that are inside of a store are called stock. So that's what they have in stock. The managers, the business needs to manage this stock. So when everything sells, you have to buy more products. And when you're buying, you have to make decisions about buying. How do I know how much to buy? When should I buy it? These are all important things to think about. This used to be a manual task. Now barcodes are allowing this to be automated. And barcodes in stock control talks about that process of automation. And there are a few key steps. So first of all, your barcode is going to be scanned. Now, when this barcode is scanned, it will then be looked up inside of a database. And in that database will be a product ID. The product ID matches the barcode number. And that's the primary key because it is a unique identifier that cannot be duplicated. So each item of stock has a unique identifier, the barcode, the product ID. So that's scanned and found in the database. Then however many has been bought, so for example, if one item is bought, then the total in stock would be minus by one. Okay, so reduce one for each time the barcode was read or each one time a product is sold. If they bought three of that item, it would be reduced by three. Then the new value will be written back into the stock. So think about when you're programming, this is how we would change a variable. We would say the total in stock will now become the total in stock minus one. Total in stock will be assigned the new value, total in stock minus one. So if we had 21 at first, we minus one and you've got 20 left in stock. So that's one of the first processes is just managing the stock and keeping a running total. So once an item has been deducted from the stock level, 
Another process is for reordering that stock. So the company will set a value, which is the reorder level. So for example, 20. And if the total in stock, once they've minused what has been bought, if that total in stock is now less than or equal to the reorder value, then an order will be placed. And this is very useful for companies to ensure that at certain times they're not without the amount of stock that they need, but they always have the products in store that are required by the customer and therefore keeping the customers satisfied. Now, once this has been set, it's really important that we don't keep reordering. So imagine if we set that reorder value at 20, someone buys one, we've only got 20 in stock, so it reorders. Then two minutes later, another person buys another turkey. Now we're down to 19 turkeys. If we run this same piece of code again, we're gonna reorder another lot of turkeys. You could end up setting off 19 different orders of turkeys. Then you've got a problem because you cannot sell all these turkeys and you lost money. So what we do for this is we use what's called a flag. Now this is common in programming. Uh, we use it in this stock control and it allows us to prevent any sort of reorder error. So once it has been sent for reorder, once a product has been reordered, a flag will be added onto the account. And then we'll get a slightly different type of code. So our condition would be, if the total in stock is less than or equal to the reorder value, and the flag is set to no. So if there's no flag, it hasn't been ordered, and then we can say, let's place that order. And once the stock arrives, then the stock levels will be updated again. So the number in stock would be added to based on how many were bought and the reordering flag would be removed. It would be set back to no. So how does this automatic stock control have advantages to businesses? Most of the time, the advantage to any business will be about saving time and money. Businesses are for profit. Of course, you get non-profit organizations, but in the general world, businesses are about profit. Employees cost money. So you employ somebody, you have to pay for that person. If you can reduce the amount of working hours needed by an employee, then you reduce the number of employees that you have to hire. You reduce the money amount that is spent. And this is actually something that, I mean, we can go into more in ethics, but not today, but it's something to think about is the process of automation and just how that is affecting jobs today and you might hear about robots taking over and the automation of industry car manufacturing for example and now even onto taxis and automated cars so directly this is a faster and easier way for the prices to be changed so if for example we have an increase in the price of one product what you do is you go to your computer system, you go to the database, you change that price, and then every time something is scanned after that, the correct price will be retrieved. It also allows for this automatic stock control. So that means that again, we save time for the employees because they don't have to go around counting the stock, figuring out what needs to reorder, placing orders with the actual company who sends them their stock. It's all automatically completed. So again, that's saving time for the employees. In addition, you don't need to price everything. So before you used to have to go to every product, put a price on top of that product um, so that one, the customer knows and two, the employee knows how much it costs so they can manually enter that price at the till. Well, now you don't need any labeling because the barcode is gonna retrieve all that for you. So again, that saves time to the employees. Also, not only are they collecting data on products, but we also collect data on people. What that means is, look at this database example here. Now, we've got a products table, but there are also three other tables here. And we can look specifically at 
invoices, so specific sales that people have made and the number of items that are in that sale, what time of day that sale happened. We can look at who was selling the product. You can go to an individual customer and look at their trends. You know, what days of the week do they come shopping? How much do they spend? What are the type of items that they buy? All of this data is powerful for business owners because it means that they can be more up to date with sales trends and data so they can think about, oh, what sort of, of uh, promotion should we do in the future? And they can also know what customers like, what do customers want to buy and how can we tailor their shopping to bring them in for the item they want to buy and then target them with other items that we want to sell them to make them spend more money to make more money. So this data analysis that you get is key. So these are the key responses, two key responses that you can use. So what about the customers? What's their advantage? Because the business is making money, the business is saving on employees, and they're finding a lot of data to be able to target us with what they want to sell. At the checkout, when you're physically there, it's going to be much faster for you to get through because it can just be automatically scanned. And even we now have these automatic scanning systems at self-checkout, so you can get yourself through also, because you don't need the skill, you just need to be able to scan. So that's gonna make it faster. Then also it reduces error, because the manual entry, and we talked about this at the start of the video, when you're manually entering something, you're more likely to make an error. So by not having to manually enter prices, there is less chance of human error. This is the itemized bill. So customers are gonna get an itemized bill. Wasn't that long ago that that didn't happen. You just got, if you did get a receipt, it just had a total at the bottom of how much you had spent. Now you can take away that full receipt and you can look in detail exactly how much you spent on each item. Another advantage is that cost savings are passed on to the customer or you hope that they would be passed on to you. So these time saving and money saving aspects for the business mean that they can afford to run more sales. They can manage to give better value to the customer. And also they can be used to track sell by dates. So a lot of food has an expiration date on it, has a sell by date on it. So by being able to track the products that are in stock and the dates that are on them, as well as being able to track how many of a certain item you're likely to spend, it means that the company can know how many do I need to order for this day? How many loaves of bread do I need? How many cartons of milk do I need? That make sure that they're just buying enough products for that day and not overbuying and you have to buy something that has a short date or has already been on the shelf for a day or two. So let's look at some exam questions. And um, we're basically just gonna take that information that we've looked at in the last slides, and they're all gonna to relate to here, apart from principles of operation, which you were gonna to wanna to watch the previous video to understand, and that one's called How Barcodes Work. I'll put a link to that in the description below. Here's a part one question. So a lot of the time in the exam, they'll have multiple parts. If we come to a scenario about supermarket, you're going to get multiple questions about that, which test different aspects of your knowledge. And that's why it's important to read the question, because you always want to identify, are they looking for principles of operation? Are they looking for input outputs? Are they looking for advantages, disadvantages? Are they looking for where it's used and how it's used? So here in this question, immediately we can see it's asking for inputs and outputs. You want to make sure you pay attention to the bolding. We want two inputs, one output. And this is a supermarket system that lets people check their own shopping. So we're at the point of sale in a supermarket, and it is the customer that is checking their shopping. So you need to make sure here, when we talk about the purpose, how, why it's used, that's for the customer not the employee. First input device. Well, there's lots of different ones that we looked at on the first page. I'm going to go with barcode scanner because that's what we've been talking about. So an input device would be a barcode scanner. First, just state what the device is. Then the purpose is how that is used. How is it used? 
Well, it allows the customer to scan the products and retrieve the data, such as the price from the stock database. The key things to say here would be scan. So you want to indicate that it is scanning, that you know how it works. It works by scanning a product and that it retrieves data. So those are the key ones is that it's scanning and then retrieving the data from the database. Let's have a look at another. So how about the touch screen? So that allows customers. So I've specifically said here customers. So we're going to allow the customer to enter details and that's showing. I understand it's an input device. We're entering the details in and that could be things like loyalty card numbers or payment methods. So I've given an example that relates to shopping. It's about paying, having a loyalty card, and it's the customer that's doing it. So that's a full sentence answer that relates back to the scenario and displays my understanding of what an input device is. So let's look at our output device. We're going to go with a printer. So the printer is going to allow customers. So again, it's the customer that's benefiting here and it allows the customer to print an itemized receipt for their purchase. Okay, so here's a slightly longer one. We're going to look at how many marks we get here. So this is a four mark question. And a supermarket uses a barcode scanner to read the barcodes on its products. Describe how the barcode scanner reads the barcode. So there's no customer, there's no people. They want to know how the barcode scanner reads the barcode. Okay. So this is a principle of operation question. If it's how it works, it's principles of operation. So we're going technical. So the key things we want to do here is talk about, use these keywords. What's the barcode scanner doing exactly? How is that data on the barcode being read and retrieved? And use those keywords. So first of all, what happens? Well, our barcode is going to be scanned using the barcode scanner. So a red light from the barcode scanner will be shone onto the product's barcode. The sensor is going to detect the level of light coming back. Now I've highlighted here sensor specifically. If you say the barcode scanner will read the level of light, if you say the microprocessor will read the level of light, you lost the mark. You must be specific that you understand it's the sensor that is doing the reading here. The sensor detects the levels of light that are reflected back. Those lights will be reflected back. The dark line will reflect as a low level of light and the white lines as a large amount of light. And if you remember from our first video, if you didn't watch the first video, please go back and watch how barcodes work and it'll explain this whole process to you. That black and white line relates to specific bit patterns of binary value. And each of those is a number on the code. Well, then that bit pattern is translated by the microprocessor. So again, that's in bold because we need to understand that it's the microprocessor that recognizes and understands what those bit patterns mean. So when it sees a certain bit pattern, it's a microprocessor that, processor that can interpret that and recognize the full barcode number. How the barcode system could help the supermarket manage its stock. So here we need to make sure we talk about stock and stock control of the barcode system and that it is a supermarket. So we want to relate this to the supermarket scenario. So each sentence is a mark. We actually only need three. So we've got a lot of different ones here to choose from. So first of all, we want to make it be known that the barcode is uniquely identifying a product. That's important because it relates to the primary key. So each barcode uniquely identifies a product and the data about those products can be stored in the database. When scanned, the product is looked up in the stock database. Now notice here, I didn't mention about the barcode scanner, any of the reflected light, anything like that. 
It didn't ask me how the barcode worked. It asked me how it could help to manage stock. So here, just when scanned is enough information. So when it is scanned, the product is looked up in the stock database. Now that stock can then be automatically deducted. Now I've highlighted multiple times here this term automatically. Automatically deducted, automatically reorder, automatically updated. Automation is what we're talking about here, and that's how it's working for the supermarket. So the stock can be automatically deducted from the stock level when it's purchased. Then, if a stock level is below that set reorder level, then it can be set to either alert the business or automatically reorder more. Yet some businesses might not want it automatically reordering. They might just want it to appear as an alert on their report at the end of the day so they can get a report of all the printouts. And then they could have in their query from the database, it could just show a list of all the products that have been flagged for reorder. And then they can make a decision about if they actually want to reorder it. Other types of shops just want it automatically coming out. So the flag is then placed on the product to stop duplicating the reorder. And then when this new stock arrives, it's automatically updated and the flag will be removed. Okay, so let's look at a different one in another scenario. Now we haven't directly learned this scenario, but that's not important because we can still answer questions about how this will work. So it says that the airline boarding pass can be read from a smartphone instead of a printout. And you might have experienced this yourself and stored it in your Apple wallet. It's very common now in um, airport technology. So it says identify what type of barcode A is an example of. So here is A and it's pointing to this type of barcode here. It says explain how the data stored in this type of barcode is read. So if it's about the data, how it's stored, how it's read, again, we shall know that this is a principles of operation question. Just need to relate it back to the scenario. This is a quick response code. You can say QR code, but quick response is the full term that they're looking for and what I would use. If you want to say QR, say quick response, brackets, QR. This type of barcode is captured using a camera or a QR code scanner. So that's an important mark you can get there. Just understanding that this is not your normal barcode, that it is a QR code, it's different. Now, it's usually captured with a camera and that's fine. But I've also put the QR code scanner here because we're in the airport. And if you've ever used it to scan your QR code, you will know it's a, it's a QR code scanner on a machine as you walk through the gate. The light is shone onto the barcode and that will be reflected back. So the same process as all barcodes, it's about the light being reflected back and that those dark squares are reflecting less than the white ones because the black absorbs the light and the white is reflecting the light. And all of this data is then processed by an app. So that's the other key difference with the main barcode is that instead of the processor interpreting, it's gonna be an app that will interpret the data. And this identifies the large black squares. So that's these ones here. And those are the modules. And that's gonna to help to identify orientation. And then the other squares here those are the data to be decoded that identify the passenger's flight um, and passenger data. The main part here where I identified it back to the scenario was by saying passenger and flight data instead of just saying, oh, the data's decoded to retrieve the data. We can give an example of what that data might be. And that's really all you need to do to relate to a scenario. And if you just imagine yourself there, or even just look at this picture and see all of the data that is stored, or well, what's the data that it's storing there? It actually shows you on screen in your application what data will be retrieved when they scan that QR code. And it's just passing that data that you have here onto the airport. Okay, so that's a few examples of 
how you might answer examination questions, how you can relate those questions back to the scenario, and how to make sure that you're looking at either the principles of operation, the purpose of what it's used for, so how it's used, or the advantages and disadvantages to the people that use it. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and turn on the notifications so you can know every time a new video arrives and build up your collection of IGCSE videos to help you pass your computer science exam. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to send me a comment. I'll try to reply to any that I can. And hopefully we can bring you some clarity and understanding to anything that might be confusing you.